Okay, let's open our Bibles to the book of Hebrews, chapter 4. And uh, we're going to concentrate eventually on verses 12 and 13 today. But before we get there, last time we summarized the first 11 verses of chapter 4 by discussing verse 11 back in chapter 3. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. And there are actually four rests referred to in this section of the Bible. We're going to do to recap quickly. There's the weekly rest of every Sabbath day, mentioned in chapter 4, verse 4. There was the rest of the Jews entering into Canaan with Joshua and Caleb, and that's referred to in chapter 3, verses 11, and also 18. And then, thirdly, there was the rest of the Jew who survives the tribulation and will go into the millennium when Christ returns, mentioned there in chapter 4, verse 11. And then there's the believer's rest from his own works by trusting in Christ's death alone. Chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, and they switch from one to the other rather quickly from one verse to the next verse. And if you don't pay close attention to rightly divide the word of truth, you can uh, conclude that you're saved by grace through faith, plus nothing, but you have to then labor now in this life to be sure of it or to, to guarantee your entrance into heaven one day. Look at chapter 4, verse 11. Let, let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. And he uses the Jews who didn't believe that God would uh, lead them into Canaan. They wanted to rebel against Moses. And uh, likewise, those who, who, un, who fail to believe or they lack faith or lack uh, uh, confidence uh, might not enter into God's rest. And uh, the, the Christian or the so-called preacher or minister who confounds all of these different rests is going to come away thinking that uh, in order to secure your salvation, uh, you must labor and work and be diligent to do good works to sort of secure it, to hammer it down, to nail it down, make sure you can't lose it. And uh, that, that means that it's possible to lose it if you don't do that. And that's why so many people think you can lose your salvation because they've never studied carefully the, the differences between these different rests mentioned in the scriptures. Um, but today, let's read Hebrews 4, verses 12 and 13. They say, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Do you know, I'm going to jump ahead there to verse 13. Since the Lord Jesus isn't here on the earth now, and he had already ascended when the Apostle Paul wrote these verses. He, the, the one that with whom we have to do is the only one left here on the earth that we can touch. Catholics have rosaries and they have candles, they have statues and images, they have all sorts of symbols, holy cards, prayer cards, uh, uh, scapulas underneath their clothing. They have all kinds of visible physical things. They light incense to symbolize their prayers. They have a candle to symbolize the light of Christ. They have a priest to symbolize a, a, a man of God. <laughs> He's not one. And they have a wafer and a wine that's supposed to be the actual flesh and blood of Jesus. But God only left the believer with one physical object to touch and to hold and to interact with and by which he can communicate with God. And that's this book. You don't need any of the other things. People like to flood your mind and your life with all sorts of objects and symbols and statues 
and uh, artwork. Um, there's a, there's a, the uh, supposed tooth or one or two teeth of the Buddha that travels around from monastery to monastery. They think uh, this was his part of his body. Uh, it wasn't, and they don't, I don't know what, where they got it from, but there's more than one, and it travels around, like making its rounds from temple to temple, and the people will come there, and they're, they're told that this is a sacred holy object because it once belonged to the, the Buddha. Uh, it didn't, and uh, there's such thin evidence about his life that everything Buddhists are taught and believe was just invented out of thin air and repeated by the monks. And the same thing could be true, uh, could say, be said of uh, Hindu objects, Hindu <laughs> relics and things of that sort. You know, in every, in every Catholic church, this is something most, even many Catholics don't know, but in every Catholic church, the, the, the altar where the priest supposedly changes the bread and the wine into the flesh and blood of Jesus. Inside every Catholic altar, there's a little hole, and inside that hole they have deposited relics, a piece of clothing, a piece of bone, perhaps a tooth or some skin or a, couple of, or a few strands of hair from some supposed Catholic saint. And they, they put that into the altar and then they seal up that that opening, and that, the presence of those holy objects is supposed to make the altar now suitable to perform their magic trick of the bread and the wine. A lot of Catholics don't know that that's there, but that is. I would have, in fact, I've talked to a lot of priests, and some of them, um, I don't think, are quite up to speed on it, or maybe they've forgotten if they were ever taught it in seminary. But every Catholic altar has some relics of some saint deposit into it, and that's supposed to make the altar holy and, and usable for their consecrating of bread and wine. But the only physical object God gave us to touch and to feel and hold with our own hands and read with our own eyes is the Bible. And thank God He gave it to us. Amen. Um, but the Word of God in the passage is a reference to the words which God spoke. The comparison of the written word to a sword uh, is, should be unmistakable. Go back, if you will, to Psalm 149. Psalm 149. And notice <clears throat> one verse there. Verse 6, that the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. It's been, I'm going to, I'm going to attempt to preach on this subject about music and praise next week. But it was said, it's been said very often over the years that Christians have always traveled with two books in the service of the Lord. One, the Bible, and the other, the song book, or the hymn book. And then you have a lot of modern day uh, preachers that like to add a third book called the checkbook. <laughs> Forget about that. But two books, the Bible and the hymn book, or the song book. And uh, this is a verse that they use to, uh, for that inspiration of that statement. I think it's appropriate, but the two-edged sword in their hand would be the Bible they hold in their hand. That's the two-edged sword. Go off forward to the book of Ephesians, chapter 6. Ephesians 6. And here Paul's describing the, the armor of the Christian, verse 17. He says, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So the, the allusion to a sword being likened to the Word of God or vice versa, it should be unmistakable. It's a reference to the Word of God. 
That's the sword. And the word quickened, as, as it's used in Ephesians 2, uh, 1, you have the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, means to give life to something. They say there are two kinds of jaywalkers, the quick and the dead. But oh, boom. There are two, here in Southern California, Los Angeles, we have two baseball teams, the Dodgers and the Angels. And someone made the comment about the traffic here in Los Angeles. Uh, those who dodge the traffic are the ones that are quick. And those who don't dodge it are the dead. They're the angels. I don't know who came up with that, but I guess you could apply it. So the quick, here in Hebrews 4, verse 12, means that, that the Word of God is alive. It's alive. I realize it's paper and, and ink uh, in a binding, and it's published on a, and printed on a, a factory press, and it's a professional product. But there's something that travels with the words of this book that make it alive. He says, sharper than any two-edged sword. It's not just a sword, but it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts both ways if you don't approach it with care and with caution. And it says, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, indicating that the soul and the spirit are not synonymous with each other. They are separate from one another. And yet it takes... A, the Bible in plain English to reveal that truth because so many uh, language scholars seem unable to make the distinction between, between soul and spirit. A soul has a bodily shape according to 1 Samuel chapter 28 when Saul called up the departed soul of uh, Samuel the prophet. Uh, it can wear a robe, according to Revelation 6, verse 11. It has eyes and a mouth and ears and can, uh, according to uh, Luke 16, it can recognize other souls in the departed world. He saw Abraham afar off, the rich man in Luke 16. It can communicate with the living and with the dead, 1 Samuel 28, <clears throat> verse 15. And it can sense both pleasure or pain. Uh, Luke 16, the rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus enjoying comfort, the rich man tormented in flames. <clears throat> but the spirit is shapeless. It's like wind, it's like air, it's like the breath. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh or whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Uh, John 3, verse 8. He says, and of the joints and marrow, verse 12. Go back, if you will, to Isaiah 40. Not Isaiah, Job 40, excuse me. Job, verse 40. Job 40, let's begin there with verse 15. So the Word of God is described as a sword. It's able to cut between the soul and the spirit. And he says there are also the joints and the marrow. That's physical. But let's begin with verse 15. Behold now Behemoth, which I made with thee, he eateth grass as an ox, Lo, now, his strength is in his loins, and his force is in the navel of his belly. He moveth his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. His bones are as strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. And he says in verse 15, He is the chief of the ways of God. The Lord told Satan, Thou wast 
perfect in thy ways from the day thou wast created, till iniquity was found in thee. Ezekiel 28, verse 15. He says, He that made him can make his sword to approach unto him. So Behemoth, whatever creature that was, and there are all sorts of speculation from an alligator to an elephant to a hippopotamus to a long-necked dinosaur, uh, plesiosaur, uh, or something like that, which is probably maybe more accurate than we realize. And there are all sorts of speculations of what Behemoth actually was describing, but he was a type of the devil, a, a type of the devil. And he says in verse 19 that he that made him can make his sword to approach unto him. And the reason why Christ quoted scripture to the, the devil, to Satan, uh, in the temptation, Luke chapter 4, Matthew chapter 4, is because he knows the scriptures are a sword, and only that sword can pierce or penetrate uh, and cut to the bone uh, Satan and all of his, all of his uh, attempts to destroy the Christian or to undermine the power of God and the gospel of Christ, the word of God. It's funny. I, I think I've said this to you before, but the more, the more modern translations are put out on the market, the more modern versions are launched out there for sale. And we just got done preaching a sermon about the King James Bible, and maybe I get excited and I use the, 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 the word crap more often than I should. Forgive me if, I, if that's the case. But these modern Bibles, it, it's as though they realize they can never match the beauty and the elegance of the King James language. And it's almost as though they're not even trying. When they talk about someone not sitting on the toilet or they talk about, you know, uh, wrapped snugly in strips of cloth. What kind of gibberish is that? That's not even poetic, it's not lovely, it's, there's no rhythm, there's no flow, there's nothing memorable about, memorable about it. There's nothing about that that you'd want to, you see these little precious moments uh, uh, type uh, artwork, they have some little cutesy phrase or verse from the Bible, sometimes on, underneath them. There's nothing in any of those modern versions or paraphrases that you'd want to reproduce in crochet or a needlepoint or cross stitch and put that on your on your wall. There's nothing about that that you'd want as a as an art piece hanging uh, in your living room. None of it. You know, in the in the Living Bible, Kenneth Taylor's paraphrase, when Saul was angry because Jonathan, his son, was loyal to David, and Saul wanted to kill David, he said to Jonathan. Thou, in our Bible, thou son of a perverse and a rebellious woman. It's like, it's, it's like saying, uh, you're your mother's kid, not my kid. But Kenneth Taylor's Living Bible said, you S-O-B. And he didn't abbreviate it like I just did. He spelled it all out. And Kenneth Taylor's explanation for why he wrote that paraphrase, the Living Bible, <laughs> He said it was because his children didn't understand it when he was reading the Bible to them at the dinner table. So he wanted to rewrite it in something that would be more understandable for youngsters. Is that the way you talk to your kids at home? Or, or maybe your God is out sitting on the toilet, like, he's, like um, Elijah told the prophets of Baal in his version. You know, they claim to be updating it, but they don't always update it. Paul said... Those things, uh, he talks about his testimony, and he says, what sort of things were gained to me, those things I count as dung, that I might win Christ. They don't update that word in the modern versions. They, they call it refuse, they call it waste, they call it garbage or trash. What's brown and sounds like a bell? Dung. Everybody understands that word. I mean, if you're, if you're half literate in in English. 
But they don't do what they claim to be doing. Sometimes they obscure it, like the examples I gave in our sermon. But he says, um, also in our text, he is a dis the Bible, the Word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and intents, we would say intentions, of the heart. Verse, and notice verse 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Who is the his and the him in verse 13? Well, the antecedent is going to be there in verse 12, the word of God. You can't say, well, that's a reference to Jesus, that's a reference to God the Father. Because right in the context, the subject is introduced there in verse 12 as the Word of God. It's not Jesus, that's the Word of God, the Scriptures. And it's as though the Scriptures are alive, they're watching you, they see what you're doing, they know what you're thinking. Dr. Ruckman's testimony is very uh, profound uh, in many ways. He said, after spending years, he was 27 years old when he finally got saved. And prior to that, he was in the uh, U.S. Army and had been over the Philippines and Japan and studied Zen Buddhism and meditation, a lot of Eastern religions. And he said, um, once you're, you're exposed to that, you start hearing voices, unclean spirits, no doubt. But he didn't know that at the time. He said, when he started reading the Bible, it was, it was as though the, the Bible was able to anticipate his next question and would address it before he could even ask it. And he said, he got to where he thought the Bible was staring at him when he was sleeping at night, sitting on his dresser. That's how... how um, uh, dramatically, the, the Word of God uh, influenced him and affected him and changed his life and the way he thought about the world, the way he saw the world, um, now through the, the, the lens of the Word of God, the Scriptures. And he says, you hear voices and you, you can tell which one is your voice, which one is some other outside voice. And he never heard this voice before speaking to him until he began reading the Bible. And... Uh, he said it was though it was anticipating his next question before he could ask it. So, the Bible is described as having personality, being like a person, like someone who's able to um, ex uh, understand your next thought, your next question, your next action, the, the reason why you're carrying out those actions. Go, if you will, back to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. Uh, let's read the first four verses. O Lord, Thou hast searched me and known me, Thou knowest my down-sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought far off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Now I'll go forward to the book of John. The Gospel of John, chapter 2. Uh, we'll start at verse 23. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. 
But Jesus did not commit himself unto them, because he knew all men, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Go back now to the book of Proverbs, chapter 20. Proverbs 20. Verse 27, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. Well, it's not just the spirit of man, it's going to have to be the spirit of, of God, the Holy Spirit. You know that in the book of Romans, Paul says, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the spirit himself helpeth our uh, spirit with groanings which cannot be uttered. The Holy Spirit knows what it is you want to convey to God, what you want to pray to God, ask God for. Sometimes you're not even sure how to word it, what, how to put it into words or how to express it, but the Holy Spirit already knows what it is you're trying to ask of God. And so He intercedes, He gets involved, He communicates your need, your desires to God when you're not even sure how to ask. So, all four, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and the Scriptures are said to be able to discern and understand the thoughts and intents of the heart and know the deepest part of a man or a woman, respectively. I want you to turn to two more places and we'll conclude for today. First of all, Galatians chapter 3 Galatians 3, uh, verses 7 and 8. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. The scripture... The Bible says the scripture preached something to Abraham. Well, when God made those promises to Abraham, there was no scripture. Nothing had been written yet. Paul's a little bit confused. He's, conf he's confounded the word scripture for the Lord God. Go back to the book of Romans, chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, and <clears throat> oh, verses 16 and 17. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Well, when Moses contended with Pharaoh, there was no scripture written. There was no Bible. No, no scriptures. The commandments hadn't been given on Mount Sinai yet. So again, Paul uh, is a little confused. He's going to replace, substitute the word scripture for what ought to have been God. Or the Lord God. And there's no escaping it. That both the Lord Jesus and the written scriptures are, each, are both called the Word of God. If you want to... If you want to know the scriptures, the first thing you have to do is know the Savior. People, it's, it's an amazing thing. I, I told a guy years ago, 
I was working for Focus on the Family when they were in Pomona. I got to talk about these things with a guy, this was probably 26, 27 years ago, or maybe more than that, 28 years ago. And I said, it's funny how people can approach any book, whether it's on biology or music or computer repair or, you know, woodworking or anything else, and if they just pay attention to the text and are careful in what they're reading and follow the directions, they can understand the subject. And yet, people, many times uh, educated people, can approach the Bible, but if they're not saved, it's like God has put a lock on the Bible. They can't open it up. They read a verse, and they assume it means uh, that they, they assume that verse is the rule to apply to all the scriptures. Right up the street from us, about 200 yards, maybe 100 yards, there's another church, and they think that Acts 2.38 is the plan of salvation. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And they preach that Acts 2.38 is the plan of salvation for everybody, that you have to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus only. They don't believe in the Trinity up, up the street there. They're called United Pentecostals, and uh, all they prove is that they don't know how to read. You take one verse, I told this Mormon fellow yesterday, a verse without its con a text without context becomes a pretext. And you can use that one verse and you try to say, force that one verse onto every other part of the Bible, and it doesn't work that way. The Seventh-day Adventists do the same thing with the idea of worshiping only on Saturday. And uh, the Mormons do the same thing with the idea that they need a prophet uh, to reveal God's truth to them. Otherwise, it's not, it's not available to men. And people will do that all day long, uh, from sunup to sundown, and, and come away confused and confounded, un not, under, not able to understand the scriptures. It's as though God has put a, a lock uh, on the Bible, and no one can unlock it, no one can open it up, until they know the Savior. Amen. And then let me turn that around. I told this fellow at Focus on the Family. And yet, nobody can really learn about the Savior, about the Lord Jesus Christ, unless he gets his nose into the Bible and starts reading it and trusting. But, but you can't just read it. You have to believe what you're reading is true. Otherwise, it has no effect. It has no benefit. It bears no fruit. If, you're not, if you don't have a believing heart to believe that everything I'm reading are the words of God, even the punctuation, placed there exactly as God wants it to be, and those are the words, that's the vocabulary He wants me to learn and to, and to understand, and by which He wants me to understand Him, unless you believe that, you're not going to get anywhere in your Bible reading, your Bible study. You'll be confused and thinking you can lose your salvation because you're not comparing Scripture with Scripture and letting the scriptures define themselves and explain themselves. It seems like a very simple proposition, let the scriptures explain themselves. And yet it's, it's overlooked, it's sidestepped, it's avoided, it's missed by so many people. And it shouldn't be. It should be very simple. It doesn't make sense, and I was talking to these two preachers yesterday I told you about. And I said, uh, at our church, we believe the King James Bible is still the word of God. Where the word of a king is, there is power, the Bible says. Of course, most black preachers, they're raised to uh, love the King James Bible. And they, they know it has a certain flow and a rhythm and a cadence to it that cannot be uh, duplicated. And they say, amen to that. And I said, doesn't it make sense that if God wanted us to know his words, he'd put it in a form that is as, as simple as it possibly could be, make sure everybody has a copy of it, a man named uh, Adam Nicholson uh, is a British author. Um, he wrote a book about the translators of the King James Bible called God's Secretaries, which I have a copy of. And I think I was conservative last week in my sermon. I said the King James Bible has probably gone into at least two billion copies. Well, Adam Nicholson's 
uh, estimate is that closer to 5 billion copies of the King James Bible have been printed, sold, distributed over the last 400 years. And um, he probably put more research into that than I did. And so he may be right. He may be right. <coughs> but it, it sure seems to me that, that, like an old country preacher would say, put the grain down on the floor where the billy goats can get it. Don't put it way up on a shelf where only the farmer with his special stepladder can reach it, right? Put it down there where everybody has access to it, can, can grab a hold of it, and, um, and avail themselves of it. And these two preachers yesterday, they said, yeah, we, we like to tell our people, it's like putting the cookie jar within reach of the kids so they can get one. <laughs> and that's not bad either. That's not bad preaching at all. <clears throat> 